Good morning. My name is Kim Montana, and on behalf of the staff and the worship committee, we welcome you to church today. Whether you're joining us in the sanctuary or from the internet, we're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us for the first time today or for the first time in a long time, I see some faces that haven't been in a while. Good to see you. We do have a welcome gift for you on the welcome table in the narthex. So as you exit the church uh, in about an hour to go to Fellowship Hall, please stop by and take one of those gifts. Uh, shortly, we'll be dismissing the children for Sunday school, and also we do have a nursery available um, to your right as you exit the building if you do need that. If you think you're going to try and escape the sermon, please know that it's piped loudly into the nursery, so there's no getting out of it. If you see an unfamiliar face around you, please take a moment while you're standing and greeting each other to say hello and introduce yourself. As we take our seats, Donna Marie is going to lead us through an intro that is uh, called God Will Take Care of You. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let's just focus on that premise. God will take care of us. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. God has called us to this place today, gathering us together from near and far to proclaim and affirm the power of love within a hurting and lonely world. May this be a time for us in which our spirits are refreshed, our souls are restored, our, our relationships strengthened, and our resolve made more steadfast. Come, let us stand and call on each other into this time of worship. The Mighty One speaks and calls out to the earth. God is coming. The Righteous One gathers the faithful from the east and west. We come with the 
thanksgiving as our sacrifice. Thanks be to God. Amen. Verse of how firm a foundation we sing. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. And there's a footnote um, that references Hebrews 13:5 um, for that line, and it and that scripture is: Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For He has said, "I will never leave you or forsake you." As we prepare ourselves for our congregational prayer this morning, please note that there will be a moment of brief silence for us each to lift up our own personal prayers to God. Let us pray. God of blessing, you fling the stars into the heavens and show us more blessings than we can count. You give us treasures that can be, cannot be destroyed. You promise us a feast and peace and peace without end, and you hear our prayers. We pray for your world, wounded and scarred. Heal the earth's body and lead us to care. We pray for your church, divided and angry. Unite us in mission and grow us in love. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, the lonely. Gather them in and show us how to love. We pray for the addicted. Save them and strengthen them. We 
pray for those who have no hope. Give them faith in you. We pray for the greedy. Make them generous. We pray for the poor. Sustain them and give them hope. We pray for all those whose burdens we carry in our hearts and offer them up to you. Heal them, comfort them, guide them, make them whole. Now increase our faith and amplify our hope that by the power of your spirit, we might serve you well and be ready to greet you when Christ comes in glory. Thank you for that prayer. And it's in unison that we all say amen. At this time, we do invite the children of Sunday school age to meet Miss Terry in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, parents, if you're new to the church or you feel like you'd like to um, go with your children to see where they'll be, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, again, that's Terry. She's waiting for you in the back of the sanctuary. Um, they're going to go have some fun and learn about Jesus. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 to 40, in which Jesus speaks of a marriage feast according to Jewish custom to teach about the readiness for service. Listen for the word of the Lord. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. We, this will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself will treat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would not permit his house to be broken into. You must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. The word of God for the people of God. Be well, good morning. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here at North Scottsdale United Methodist Church. And we are so grateful to have all of you together 
joining us in worship this morning. It's a good thing when God's people come together, and, and it is because of you and your presence and your commitment to being here, either in person or online, that, that this service is what it's going to be today. Because we believe that God has something powerful to say to each one of us, and powerful ways to move, and powerful ways to be known to us in, in real and moving ways. And so it is my prayer that you feel that this morning, whether through the word, through uh, the sermon, or through the giving of our offerings, or even through communion that we're going to uh, later participate in as a community. As you can see, I have a couple props with me today. I have uh, a backpack. Uh, this is um, uh, a gamer backpack. It has a little pouch in the shape of a, a video game controller and uh, a dinosaur lunchbox. And, and this, is actually, uh, this is actually connected to a long-standing Methodist tradition called the pastor's tax, in which the pastor is able to take from the school supplies connected every year his favorite things and uh, take them home. And it's a tradition that goes all the way back to uh, John Wesley when he would rob the children of his church. And, uh, and so I'm grateful for whoever brought this. I will use it. And, and, uh, uh, as, as you might or might not know, um, we are collecting school supplies here at North Scottsdale United Methodist Church for, um, for uh, uh, communities in need within the Scottsdale area throughout the month of August. And so if you have an opportunity to do so, we would encourage you to bring school supplies as you go shopping for... Uh, uh, whatever you need to at Walmart or Target or, or a Dollar Tree, and, and to uh, pick up some things that you think that kids might use um, throughout the school year. Hand sanitizer, Lysol wipes, um, whiteboards, backpacks, um, and make them cool, because kids like cool things. They don't like boring things. They're just like us. And so, um, and what you can do is you can drop them off over there at that little, uh, that little area when you come next Sunday, because we all know that you're all going to come next Sunday. And... Uh, and the, uh, uh, the other thing to know is that throughout, uh, next week we're starting a new series called Back to Basics. And we actually will be offering up a blessing of backpacks. So if you are a child or if you're going back to school, um, a teen, a youth, or even if you're going to grad school and you want to bring your uh, fancy briefcase with you, um, you can uh, bring that next Sunday. And we're, we're going to have a time where we bless those backpacks and really bless you as students and as teachers uh, who are going back into the school year. And we'll have a special prayer each week for the next three weeks. So we'd encourage you to, to bring um, your backpack or your lunchbox or, or a grocery bag if you don't have a backpack and, uh, and come and join us for a time of prayer and celebration as we, as we really look forward to all that God is going to do through you in this next school year. So um, let's, say a, let's say a prayer as we uh, ready our hearts now for the reading of uh, today's sermon. God, you have met us in this place. You know us inside and out. You know what we're about. You know the things that are causing us anxiety, the things that are causing us joy. You know, well, you know everything about us. God, as we come before you and worship with this community, with these people that we love and who love us, may we recognize that intimacy that you have with us, that, that knowledge that you have with us, and not hold anything back but become completely vulnerable through this act of worship. And may only your words be spoken. And may only your words be heard. Amen. I don't know about any of you, but it just seems lately... Like I am constantly being told about things that I should care more about. Issues that I should be more aware of and things that I need to be more on the lookout for. For example, I'm told that I need to care about the uh, effects of institutional racism within our society and how it impacts often marginalized people of color. I, I should read more books and watch more YouTube videos and read more lengthy think pieces online about the very fiber, about how the very fiber of what we do as a culture is often embedded in a legacy of marginalization and oppression. And then I am told that I need to think about what I'm going to do about it and how I should learn to see it in almost every corner of society. It is something that I need to be always made more aware of, always more anxious over, and always more vigilant of. And then, just when I think I am beginning to get the hang of that, I am told that I am not doing nearly enough for the climate. 
And now how I should be aware of how my carbon footprint impacts the increased rates of rising temperatures around the world. I'm told that I need to care about how our decisions around energy and consumption are causing sea levels to increase. I should read more books and watch more YouTube videos and read more lengthy think pieces online about that subject, to, in, about major increases in, in weather events that will eventually displace millions of people from their homes and cause food and water shortages and might even possibly make our planet totally unhabitable for future generations. And I am told to think more about what I'm going to do about it and how I should see climate change as the most important issue that we face as a human race. And it is something that I am told that I need to always be aware of, always anxious over, always vigilant over. And just when I think I'm getting the hang of that, I am told that I need to care more about gun rights or abortion or issues around immigration or voting rights or the economy or the war in Ukraine or world hunger or the left's attempt to rob us of our freedoms or the right's attempt to dismantle our democracy or even the fact that the bee population, get this, the bee population is decreasing at an alarming rate because of the unrelenting use of pesticides and climate change. And without bees, we won't have pollinators to help us grow our avocados and almonds and melons. And what, and won't anyone, anyone think of the bees? And that, that isn't even counting all of the worrying and re reading and research that I have to do for my family's own retirement plan, my daughter's developmental milestone, the health of my marriage, or one of the hundreds of other things that just being a person with individual concerns brings to my everyday life. I mean, I'm sure that this, this isn't a hot take or anything, but, but it just seems like, like we live in a society in which we are constantly being called to be more hyper-aware, more attentive, more vigilant, about so many things that we really, truly want to care about. And it gets, it just gets exhausting, overwhelming, even. I mean, who can stay on high alert for that long? Who would want to? In a peer-reviewed article published in the Journal of Anxiety Disorders, which is a riveting read, <laughs> in 2015, researchers found that a state of hypervigilance can actually contribute to the creation of, of, of a forward feedback loop that causes people to focus even more attention on perceived threats, which makes, which makes them feel even more anxious and then therefore more hypervigilant about the things that are causing them anxiety. Playing a central role in all sorts of anxiety disorders and PTSD. And all of that might be and, and probably is true. But I tell you, I don't need a study to tell me what I see every day. Busy people rushing from thing to thing, fatigued to the point of burnout by a world that has so much need. I talk to so many people who are absolutely drained by giving all that they have to give to a world that will take so much, only to be told that they aren't giving to the right thing or, or that they need to muster up just a little more caring for a totally different issue. People who are trying their best but look like they have if they have to take one more thing onto their overscheduled, highly demanding mental load, well, they don't know what they're going to do. I know. Because I've been there. I would imagine some of you have been there as well, and maybe you are there. Maybe I am there right now. And that is perhaps why today's scripture from the Gospel of Luke triggers me a, just a little bit. Because in the midst of a society that bombards us with demands to be ever more vigilant, this word from Jesus, it just seems to add to that load. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. 
The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. You will be ready. You must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when you least expect it. As if I didn't have enough to worry about. To be on the alert for. I read this passage from the Gospel of Luke and I discover that I also have to be on the lookout for Jesus' return. I guess... I don't know, I'll just add that to my list of things to be anxious about, right along with my use of single-use plastic packaging, gerrymandering, and the fact that bananas, as we know them, might someday be extinct because of a fungus that is spreading like some sort of fruity pandemic. And that's absolutely true. You can look that up after church. Now you can worry about that too. Because growing up, I was always taught whenever this passage was read, that the return of Jesus was something that we needed to be absolutely prepared for. I grew up reading the Left Behind series, a 16-book series of best-selling religious novels that were based on a very, very specific interpretation of the book of Revelation in which someday Jesus is going to snatch up all the faithful Christians in the world, leaving the rest of us to fend for ourselves as the world ends. Let me tell you, they read like a Tom Clancy novel and the Bible just mashed together. But it wasn't just me. I remember youth leaders that I grew up with reading Matthew 24, 36 to our youth group in which we were warned that no one can know the day nor the hour of Christ's return. And so it was especially important for us to accept Jesus into our hearts now and be totally prepared for Jesus to come back at any moment. And so we, we had to be alert, vigilant, well-behaved. Because the last thing that you would want was for Jesus to come back to take away all the Christians only to find you swearing or smoking or making out with somebody in the backseat of a car in an empty parking lot. So we'd better be on our best behavior because Jesus could come back at any time and leave you behind. You know, if we're not careful, this short passage from the book of Luke can come across as, as particularly ominous or, or even foreboding. Be alert. Be ready. Because we don't know when or where or how, but Jesus is a coming. And we'd best be prepared for when he does. Or else. I mean, that's the subtext here, right? That's that we'd better get ready for Jesus' arrival, because if we aren't, well, let's just say it's better to get ready. But that is a theology, a way, of, a way of talking about God that is based in a vision of God as, as some sort of stern, emotionless father figure, returning home after a long day of work, someone who might lash out at his children if they say, the wrong thing, or even at the slightest provocation. But here's the thing. When our theology, when our ways of talking about God point us towards anything other than love, well, that is bad theology. Because we believe, of course, that God is love. Not that God is loving or that God displays the attributes of love, but that God truly is love. And part of our lifelong journey as followers of Jesus is to discover more each and every day what love truly and totally is. And so if we read this passage from the Gospel of Luke and hear it as anything other than love, then the error is ours and not God's. When we read these words of Jesus to his disciples and we hear a veiled threat, when we hear the or else behind Jesus' admonitions to be prepared, then we, 
We are indulging in a theology that leads us to believe in a God that is something other than love, which is, as I said, bad theology. Instead, a Christ-centric theology, a Jesus-centered theology, a way of understanding our faith would lead us to read this passage in a different light completely. One that is radically countercultural, telling a different sort of story than the one we find ourselves in so often. And indeed, when we read the scriptures, we should do so through the lens of Jesus as revealed to us through the Gospels in the Bible, as they are the clearest way of understanding who God is and what God is about. But that's a really much longer conversation for a different day. But as we read this passage from the Gospel of Luke this morning, we would do well to read these words as words of love and encouragement, not threats or warnings. We should see these words as as not another thing to add to our already long list of things to be worried or concerned or constantly aware of, but but instead to see them as the remedy, the answer to those sorts of things. I mean, what are the first often overlooked words of today's lectionary selection, the scripture that we just heard Dan read for us? Don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid. Because as we are reminded in 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. And there is no more perfect love than the love of God. A God that recognizes the deepest needs of this world, the most profound fears in our hearts, and answers them with a message of hope and restoration. Do not be afraid, Jesus tells his disciples. Even in the midst of an empire that seeks to rob you of your humanity for the sake of economic or military progress, even in a world that will pitch you against one another on the basis of religion or political affiliation, even in a place that demands that you spend so much of your time and so much of your energy and your attention living in constant anxiety and suspicion, do not be afraid. For the love, for the God that loves you takes great joy in presenting you with a kingdom that is totally different than the one that you are living within. A kingdom that is based in mercy, not condemnation. In hope, not despair. Jesus then implores his disciples to rid themselves of their possessions and give to those in need, because the kingdom that he is bringing to them is not one that runs off the economies of the old empires, in which one's self-worth and and sense of security is based off how many zeros are in their retirement accounts or, or how many gadgets they have in their home theater system. Instead, the kingdom that God is offering is one in which the poor and the marginalized are given the seats of honor at the banquet. And the way to true life is found in generosity, not hoarding. And the way into this kingdom is not found in our status, but instead in our ability to give our status away to those in need. That is the kingdom that the Father takes great delight in bringing to his disciples and to us today. Jesus then goes off to offer up two parables, two stories that illustrate what this kingdom of God will look like. And in the first one, Jesus describes how the servants of a household are to be ever ready for the return of their master after being away at a wedding feast. We're told that these servants, they need to be dressed for action and keep their lamps burning, prepared for when the master comes home. Jesus doesn't say 
that the servants need to be up all night, pacing back and forth, worrying about the master, and that, that the master might come back at any moment. I mean, keeping a lamp burn, burning is probably not that hard. Instead, we might imagine that the servants are called to carry out the basic tasks of the household together, taking shifts when necessary, and always listening, always attentive to the telltale signs that someone has returned home. The sound of, of horse hooves in the distance, the squeak of the gate as it slowly opens, and the creak of the porch floorboards as someone steps up to them. And then the servants who have been watching and waiting for their master to return will be ready for him when he knocks on the door and he will find that they have been faithful in their task of keeping things running in his absence. But then something strange something countercultural, something absolutely on brand for the kingdom of God happens. Instead of lumbering in and flopping down on his lazy boy recliner and turning on sports center and demanding a beer, the master instead goes in and seats his own servants. And he puts on an apron and he serves them instead. It's a subversion of what we might expect in a story like this, one in which the master isn't some cruel taskmaster that expects to see the shelves dusted and the floor swept upon his return or else. Instead, this story is about a master who overturns the systems that would insist that he be served and instead takes delight in serving and in generosity. Sell what you have and give it to the poor. Serve those who would serve you. This is the message that Jesus offers up to his disciples. It is a message in which vigilance, alertness, is not a burden to be carried. It is not another thing to worry about. But for those who are ready for the master's return, for those who are willing to bear witness to the kindness of the master, we are I mean, we're not even told what happens to those who miss out. And so, too, should we be ready, attentive and vigilant for the emergence of God's presence within this world. We, too, should listen for the familiar sounds and signs that God is about to be made known in our presence. And when we hear the knock of God in our lives and on our hearts, Great will be the joy of those of us who have paid attention and who answer it with arms wide open. Fear not, little sheep, because Jesus delights in bringing in a kingdom in which there is no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more loneliness, no more Pain. A kingdom where the weight of the world does not rest on our shoulders alone. Where we are not solely responsible for saving this world in whatever ways it needs to be saved. And if you've come to this place this morning feeling overwhelmed, if you've come to this place uh, just absolutely uh, knocked down by all the problems that the world seems to have, by all the worries of this world, if you feel like you cannot possibly take care of everything that needs to be cared about, perhaps the answer isn't simply to try harder, but isn't to instead listen more closely for the sound of God already at work throughout all of creation. When God emerges out of the anxiety of our everyday lives and offers up a third way that isn't just burying our hand, heads in the sand or, or living in, in some constant hypervigilant state of fear, but is instead a generous, mercy-filled path that leads us deeper into the heart of God's redemptive, restorative love. Perhaps the answer is not simply to care more, but to instead be open 
ourselves more to the caring presence of Christ, to look for the small ways that the kingdom of God breaks through the noise of our lives, a caring conversation here, an act of unselfish generosity there, as a reminder that there is more than fear, more than worry, more than vigilance already at work, already saving this world. Jesus closes his parables by comparing himself to a thief, which is sort of an odd look for Jesus. But, but he says that he, he is like a burglar who breaks into homes when they least expect it. And perhaps that is because we ourselves have learned to be too cynical and too skeptical of the power of love. Perhaps if we knew that God was going to try and work within our lives to change how we live, to change the things that we do, to prompt us to action, well, we would lock our hearts up tight because of the chance that we might be disappointed. But the good news of Jesus is that even through all of our doubt, all of our disbelief, all of our despair, God still finds a way, like a thief, break into our hearts. And thanks be to God that we serve a master that delights in service. Thanks be to God that our shepherd delights in bringing us the kingdom. And thanks be to God that we may, even now, prepare ourselves for love. God, we come before you this morning acknowledging that sometimes we feel like we need to really do it all. That we need to care about every issue that comes our way. That we need to be vigilant and alert and ultimately exhaust ourselves over all of the things that are wrong and broken and, and just not right about this world. But God, help us this morning to see that the way that you call us towards is not one of, of apathy and certainly not one of despair, certainly not one of worrying and anxiety, but God, the path you call us to one is one in which we are called to fear not and to embrace instead a pathway of love. As we leave this place, as we prepare ourselves through this worship to leave this place. May we, may we commit ourselves to that path of love, having faith that is even now restoring this world. In your name we pray.
Thank you for sharing. That was beautifully done. I've had the pleasure of filling in a spot on the handbell choir, and it is not easy. Uh, and the amount of bells that you two just played was about four people's worth. So very impressive. The handbell choir is starting up in October, yes. The handbell choir is starting up in October if you'd like to join. We move now into a time of giving. This week, I spent money at a restaurant, the grocery store, the gas station, and a few other places. We all spend money. Some spend lots of money. Some spend a little, but everyone in this room spends money. Most of the time when we spend money on things, we either eat them, use them, or drive them. We spend so we can experience something in the moment. Spending is a means to acquire something tangible. As I, as I was thinking about the offering this morning, I was thinking about spending money. Do you realize each week when we give money to this church, we actually get to see a tangible result? I might be so bold as to assume that, like me, each and every person has had their life touched, changed, or altered through the ministry of the church. Look around. When we give to church, we see a tangible result. People's lives are changed. Here's a great statistic for you to think about. 100% of the money that you invest in God through a local church is yours to keep forever. You don't get to keep the burger, the coffee, or the car, but when you give to a church, your investment is into people of God who he's doing work in. I do want to make special mention that we had a, an anonymous donor who was made aware that our freezer and refrigerator needed to be repaired in the kitchen, so um, that donor was able to buy a tangible product. Um, and donated a refrigerator. So we love that, and we are so thankful. On your screen and in your bulletin are ways that you can actually invest some money into something that is tangible here on earth and also for eternity. People, let us pray. Lord, you look down from heaven, see all humankind, and long to call us home. Accept these gifts on behalf of your people, that they would increase faith, nurture hope, and be reckoned as righteous in your sight. Amen.
On a regular basis here at North Scotia United Methodist Church, we partake in a ritual that we call communion. And communion is a time for us in which we join together and we have a tangible reminder, a sign and a symbol of, of, of God's work on the cross and what he, Jesus did through us through his resurrection. If you are new to our church or you feel new, we would encourage you to participate in communion if you would so like to because we believe, of course, that God's love is for everyone. And uh, if you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. We don't, we're not going to force you, and we certainly won't judge you if you don't. Just stay where you are, and, and that, that's totally okay. The way we do communion at this church is, is when you are dismissed uh, by one of our ushers, you'll come forward, and you'll receive a, 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 a cup that has some juice and a wafer in it, and you'll get a blessing from either Kim or myself, and you'll return to your seat. And as soon as everyone's gotten an element this morning, um, I will offer up a blessing from the center here, and we will partake in our communion elements together. And that will all happen after, after a short uh, reading that uh, Kim and I will do with one another. And there will be an opportunity for you during this liturgy to, uh, to participate by reading uh, the words as they appear on the screen at the appropriate time. Come, let us come to this table in God's love and faithfulness. Let us open our hearts in trust. God fills them with grace in every moment. Join together in singing songs of thanksgiving. We lift our voices in glad adoration. We lift our voices in glad adoration <laughs> to our God. When there was only the emptiness of chaos, God of our hearts, you dared to imagine that from things unseen might come wonders to behold. Stars, too many to count in the night. Flowers, varied in colors and shapes. Creatures that roamed, flew, swam. You spoke the word which brought all of this into being for those who are created in your image of hope and love. But we chose to trust temptation's lies and to hope in the emptiness of death. In dreams, with words, with love, women and men continued to call us back to you, who would fill us with grace. But we always turned away, trusting power, hate, fear, injustice instead. Then you chose to become one of us, so we might see hope walking among us, so that we might taste grace and fish and bread, so that we might know love that never ends. With those who have faith which astounds us, with those who long to see your beloved community, we join our voices in praise and wonder. Holy, 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 holy are you, God who watches over us. All creation trusts in your grace and hope. Hosanna in the highest. By grace, you set aside glory to become one of us, Christ of creation, so we might be filled with compassion we can share with others. By faith. You told us stories of servants, of prodigals, of children, so we could see ourselves as God longs us to be. By trust, you dared to let death wrap its cold arms around you, so we might be released into the comforting embrace of resurrection's hope. And by grace, we come to this table. By hope, we tell the story of Jesus. By faith, we share the mystery of salvation. Jesus died to bring light into death's gloom. Jesus was raised to bring life to all God's people. Jesus will come, so all are welcomed by God. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his closest friends at a meal. And he took a simple loaf of bread and he raised it up in front of them and he broke it. And he gave thanks to you, O God, and he told his disciples, take and eat. For this is my body which is broken for you, and as often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, Jesus took a glass of good wine, maybe a Merlot, and he lifted it up and he shared it with his friends and he said, take and drink, for this cup represents the new covenant which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of many. And as often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. 
now you come, holy God, pouring out your spirit on these gifts of the bread and the cup and on all of these people, all of these beautiful people gathered here. May the bread which is broken give us the strength to go and choose love and not hate, to share hope and not fear, and to gather people together and not divide them. And may this cup of grace nourish us to be the ones who offer compassion without condition, who offer justice and grace to all, and who will love without reservation. And when all time has come to an end, we will sit at the table in your backyard, feasting with our sisters and brothers under the stars we have never stopped counting, rejoicing with them in your grace, God in community, holy and one. Amen. Amen. Come, for now is all, all is ready for us to approach the table.
act. This is not some silly pageantry, but this is, for us who follow Jesus, a real and sacred sign, the presence of Christ in our lives. The body of Christ broken for you and the cup of salvation poured out for you. Amen. Thanks be to God. There are always a lot of exciting things happening at North Scottsdale United Methodist Church. And before we are dismissed for the day, I'd like to draw your attention to just a few of them. First, if you are looking for an easy and fun way to get away for a weekend and spend time with your family or loved ones, the NSUMC Family Camp is coming up at the end of September. Families young and old are encouraged to come up for, for a few days at Camp Mingus in the Prescott National Forest We'll take care of all the planning. All you do is show up and connect with each other, building memories for years to come. You can check out, check out nsumc.com for more information. Second, we'll, we will be holding an all-church potluck on Sunday, August 28th, immediately following the worship service. If you're interested in good food and even better company, you should come and check it out. More information on what you can bring will be released in the next few weeks, but mark your calendar now. Finally, if you enjoy singing and have wanted to find a, pla find a place to share your talents, the NSUMC Choir is going to resume its rehearsals on August 21st. Choir is not only a great place to develop your musical abilities, but is also an easy and welcoming place to connect with some of the nicest people in our church. If you're interested in learning more, you can find Darren after the service, and he'll tell you about it. Before any of you say it, I know we're 10 minutes long. <laughs> Chalk it up to a new pastor still getting his legs under him. Let's, uh, let's stand as we receive this benediction from, from God. North Scottsdale United Methodist Church, you are the beautiful people of God. And God loves you with an absolutely perfect love. Go now into a world that desperately needs to be loved and love as Christ loves you and the peace of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ will be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great day.